Today on Cook's Country, Brian makes Julia the ultimate Greek chicken. Jack challenges Bridget to a tasting of crumbled feta. Adam reveals his top pick for liquid measuring cups. And Lawman makes Bridget foolproof crushed red potatoes with garlic and herbs. That's all right here on Cook's Country. At the beginning of the 20th century, Greece was in turmoil with widespread poverty and political unrest. And that encouraged many young men to emigrate to the United States. Now, between 1880 and 1920, more than 400,000 Greeks came to America in search of opportunity, and many moved to Birmingham, Alabama. It was around that same time Birmingham was rapidly growing around the steel industry and provided plenty of jobs for the new immigrants. Not surprisingly, this influx of Greeks had a big effect on the local food. It resulted in a Mediterranean meets the South kind of cuisine that's made a lasting mark in the area. And today, Brian's going to show us how to make a hometown favorite known as Greek chicken. Brian recently spent some time eating his way around Birmingham, and although you tasted a lot of Greek food, you fell in love with a very simple dish called Greek chicken from Johnny's Restaurant. That's right. I spent time with Timothy Hansis, who's the chef owner of that restaurant, and of all the things on the menu, he was a little bit shocked that I wanted to discuss Greek baked chicken, because <laughs> it's a relatively simple dish. Tons of herbs, lots of lemon, good hit of garlic, and lots of spices. So we're going to start off with fresh herbs. We're going to use two tablespoons of fresh chopped thyme leaves. Now, we don't want to chop these herbs too finely. You want to have those big pieces on the chicken so you get a real big pop of flavor when you eat it. So we're going to go with two tablespoons of thyme leaves. So next, we have two tablespoons of chopped fresh rosemary. And again, I'm just going to take a couple of passes with my knife and try to avoid doing too much of the rocking motion. So next, we're going to talk about lemon zest. I'm going to use a vegetable peeler and I'm going to peel off six strips, and they're about three inch strips, of the zest. So I'm just going to stack those up. Give them a coarse chop. All right, oh, here we go with the lemon. It does smell good. I already smell how good that smells. Okay, what's a Greek recipe without a little bit of garlic in it? So we're gonna add five cloves of garlic. Similar to the herbs and lemon zest, coarsely chopped pieces. So five cloves of garlic go in there. Okay, and now we're going to add to that a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil, one tablespoon of kosher salt, and then we're gonna add one and a half teaspoons of dried oregano. And then we're going to add one teaspoon of ground coriander, one half teaspoon of red pepper flakes, and finally one half teaspoon of black pepper. So we're just going to mix that together, and then the marinade is ready to go. Now we're going to talk about the chicken. So this recipe calls for three pounds of chicken parts. And whenever a recipe calls for that, it's best to reach for a four pound chicken and break it down yourself into its individual pieces. Here we have our four pound chicken, and we're just going to do a quick breakdown with this. I'm going to go leg quarters, wings, breast. All right. Okay. So I like to first hold the chicken up here, kind of at an angle, and just nick away at the skin here between the thigh and the breast. And then I'll pull the chicken back mm -hmm. and then run the tip of my bony knife right down through that joint and set that aside. And we'll do the same on the second side. Again, use the weight of the chicken and kind of nick away at this joint right here around the wing, and that pops right off. Then I'll switch knives to something a little bit more sturdy. So I'm going to go on either side of the breast here, really cutting through the rib cage all the way down. So I'll work with one side at a time. And then I'll spin it around and do the second side. And we can discard this or use it for mm. chicken stock. Now we're going to break down these larger quarters into individual pieces. So we're going to split the breast right in half. We're going to score the meat until we feel that bone. And then we're going to put some pressure on the tip of the knife and rock the back of it right through the bone. Then for the thighs and the legs, there's a little seam of fat that runs right here. And if you could just run your knife right on top of that, you'll go right in between that joint. And now's a good time to trim up any excess fat from those thighs. And again, we'll do that with the second leg quarter. Then we're just going to remove the wing tip here. Mm -hmm. So you can just pop right through that joint. Oh, those are so good for stock. They have so much cartilage in them. Mm -hmm. And then the same with the second wing. So this next move is something that I started doing at home because I don't have a lot of time to marinate chicken when I get home from work. What we're going to do here is we're going to score the chicken to let the marinade penetrate a little bit deeper and get in contact with that meat. So for the breast, we're going to cut three half inch deep slashes straight across. We want to increase the surface area of the meat so the marinade is really going to stick. And with the thighs, we're going to make two slashes perpendicular to the bone, again about a half inch deep. Okay, and for the drumsticks, we're going to do two half inch deep slashes, one on either side. The wings are small enough and thin enough that the marinade will work on those without having to tinker with them at all. All right. So, 
All right, so we're just gonna toss all this chicken in the marinade. You can see already those little slashes are taking in all of those big chunks of herbs and garlic. We're gonna cover it with plastic wrap and we're gonna refrigerate it for at least 30 minutes or up to two hours. But you don't wanna to go too much longer than two hours because there's a ton of salt in here and it can get a little bit salty. It's been two hours and we're ready to cook off our chicken. So we're gonna cook the chicken in the skillet. One, because the chicken's gonna be a little bit more crowded in the pan than it would be in a baking dish. So all the juices that come from the marinade and then come out of the chicken are gonna create a nice pan sauce for us at the end. They're not gonna evaporate in the oven. Number two, the skillet is broiler safe. We're gonna broil the chicken at the end to get some nice browning on the skin. And the third, the skillet's got this nifty little handle here. Nifty. I don't know if you noticed that, <laughs> but it's easier to move in and out of the oven. Okay, so the chicken is all positioned in there, and we're gonna take all of our leftover marinade, and we're gonna make sure we get all of that into the skillet. Oh yeah. We've got the oven rack set about six inches from the broiler element, because again, we're gonna broil at the end, and the oven temperature is currently at 425 degrees. We're gonna bake the chicken for about 30 minutes until the breast meat hits 160, and then dark meat hits 175 degrees. It's been 30 minutes and we're ready to take a look at our chicken and give it a temp. Oh, it smells good. Julia, do you mind turning that oven to broil for me, please? You got it. All right, Julia, we're gonna temp the thickest part of these chicken breasts and we're looking for 160 degrees. We're at 161 and that's perfect. Pretty good. So now we're ready to broil the chicken, but before we go under the broiler, we're gonna spoon some of these pan juices which contain a lot of olive oil and chicken fat over top of the chicken. That's gonna help the chicken brown really nicely under the broiler. All right, so we've given each of these pieces a little bath in its own chicken fat and olive oil. Goodness. And we could throw them back under the broiler for about three minutes. And we wanna pay close attention because like anything you're broiling, it can go from perfect <laughs> to burnt in a matter of seconds. So we'll keep an eye on it. And if we see that it's browning unevenly, we'll just give the skillet a bit of a rotation. Sounds good. Julia, let's take a look at this gorgeous looking well-browned chicken. That is beautiful. We are gonna let this chicken rest in these pan juices for a good 10 minutes. And as it rests, some more of those juices will come out and really fortify our pan sauce. Julia, this chicken is ready to be plattered mm. and it smells good, huh? It looks gorgeous. So we are gonna put these pieces on the platter and then we have our delicious pan juices here. Mm -hmm. We're gonna add a tablespoon of juice from that lemon we zested earlier to really send it back mm. to Alabama. <laughs> Spoon these pan juices right over top of the chicken. So this good. dish is a looker. All right. Can I serve you a piece? Absolutely. So this is great to eat with like crusty bread or boiled mm -hmm. potatoes. So all those juices could soak in. All right, first I'm gonna dive right into this chicken thigh. Mmm, that is good. So simple. Big flavor. The herbs really don't overpower. And the sauce or the jus is lovely with that hit of lemon. Yeah, it's a really good balance of everything. You get a little bit of heat from the red pepper flakes. The lemon really carries it. Brian, this is delicious. Thank you. Well done. So if you wanna make this simple but flavorful recipe for baked chicken, start by making a marinade. Cut a chicken up into parts, then cut deep slashes right into the meat before rubbing with the marinade. Arrange the chicken skin side up, roast it, then finish under the broiler from Cook's Country, an incredibly easy recipe for Greek chicken. Well, I guess we're at the point in our society where we just don't have time to crumble our own feta cheese. So Jack's here and he's gonna tell us whether this convenient product comes at a cost. This is what it's now gone down to. Someone else has already crumbled the cheese for you. I'm just gonna say doing this, you know, which everybody does these days, is a lot like crumbling feta. <laughs> so if you have time to do this, you have time to crumble so feta. These are all, somebody crumbled them. Whether we, we did it or the manufacturer, I'm beginning already to tell you that one of these is actually a, our favorite block of feta that we crumbled ourselves. Interesting thing here is first of all, all of the crumbled cheeses are domestically produced. They don't do this in Greece. They make you buy, evidently, <laughs> the whole block. What that means is that the domestic cheeses are made with cow's milk. Our favorite feta cheese that's imported from Greece is made with sheep's milk. So it's like night and day. Sheep's milk is barnyardy, gamey. Cow's milk funky. is delicious, funky, but they're different from each other. So that's the first thing. Crumble size varied. And the reason why crumble size matters is because 
all of the crumbled cheeses, like all of the uh, pre-shredded cheeses, have cellulose. It's like an anti-caking agent. And if they're little teeny crumbles, they have a lot of cellulose and they seem really dry mm -hmm. and they don't melt very well. They just aren't that nice. And so bigger crumbles tend to be a little bit moister and not quite as dry. So anything that you're liking or not liking? I'm not liking this one. Okay. It's actually tough. It's really weird. It's like fibrous. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that one. Okay. Not sure uh, what that is, but pretty sure it's a picture of cheese and not actually cheese. <laughs> yeah, fibrous is not an adjective that you would want with pretty much any cheese. Yes, if uh. you opened up the walls of my house, I bet you'd find that inside. It look, it's a little bit like insulation. All right, well, duly noted, I will not open up the walls in your house. <laughs> Good policy. This one's incredibly salty. And I actually might really appreciate that in a mixture of a bunch of other things. I like the tang it has, too. Okay. So I'd say that's my favorite, that's my second, and that can go all the way over there. <laughs> Let's start with your favorite. So, you're a natural girl. You like the real deal. This is our favorite imported block feta, made with sheep's milk. Mm -hmm. You said tang. Yeah, it, it has, has tang. It has more flavor. You know, it's a, it's a strong feta. Sure. This was like a, a ghost of feta. It wasn't bad, but it didn't have as much flavor as that. Yeah, so that's the favorite of the crumbled. Okay. Uh, so this was the top rated choice, uh, Thinos. The studio audience, actually, this was their favorite of the three samples. Really? It was close, but more people in the audience favored that as opposed to the sheep's milk feta. I wonder if it's because eaten on its own, it was more balanced, it didn't have as much of that assertiveness. Yeah, it's not a nibbling cheese feta, uh, especially <laughs> no, with your not. fingers like this. No, it's not. Um, and this last one, which right. uh, is I'll the- all the way over here. Yeah, this was Treasure Cave. It's not recommended. It just was so dry. It just felt like all the moisture was gone from the cheese. It was, uh, I did, thought, tough. Yeah, not rather tough. than fibrous, but right. you know, it was it was not Chewy. a tender cheese, and it didn't really get better in the other applications, so it was not recommended. Well, there you go. Pre-crumbled feta cheese does not have to come at the cost of flavor. Our winner is Athenos crumbled feta cheese, and it's four dollars for four ounces. That's easy to remember. <laughs>Liquid measuring cups have one job, and today Adam's going to tell us which brand measures up. If they're accurate and you can read them, just like you said, job done, walk away. Not always the case. We have 10 different sets here. We tested the one cup measures. A lot of them were sold just in one cup measures. Some were sold in sets. These two were made of glass. Mm -hmm. These ones in the middle, these six were plastic, and those two by you were silicone. And the price range was a low of about $5 to a high of about $35. Ooh. We, of course, measured the accuracy. We measured them at the six most important measurements from a quarter cup on through one cup. And we used a lab grade scale to weigh out the water and then compared them to the measurement <laughs> markings. And in about half of these, Come on, they're measuring cups? They weren't accurate. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. Half of them were spot on, about half of them had inaccuracies somewhere along the lines. And in a couple of these cups, at the one cup measurement, they were off by almost a tablespoon. That's substantial. Which, that's enough to really kind of mess with the recipe a mm -hmm. little bit. Now you may notice that two of these cups, these two here actually have two sets of measurement markings, one on the side, and then a set inside the cup so that you don't have to crouch down, you can read them from up top. I appreciate that sometimes. You know, some of the testers really like that. This one with the two sets of measurements, both sets of measurements were accurate. Not the case with this one. The side markings were accurate, the top markings weren't. That's just silly. It's crazy. Now, the vessel design itself also mattered to testers, and there were a couple of aspects. Let's start with the opening at the top. If it's wider like this, at about four inches in mm -hmm. diameter, it's just easier to pour into it to check the volume of a pan sauce, especially if you're using like a big 12-inch skillet. Certainly easier than trying to get in something narrow <laughs> like that. You also want to make sure that these things are easy to pour from. Not all of them were. This one, for instance, you can see that the pouring spout oh. is a little bit off center. Aww. There were swear words flying in the test kitchen <laughs> as testers dribble liquids out of this one. And they actually tried a couple of different units on this. They thought maybe it was a manufacturing flaw on the one that they were testing. All of them had the same problem. Now, if you're crazy about getting every last drop of a viscous liquid out of the cup that's me too then you want to take a spatula and run it around the cup to get you know cream or oil something that's a little thicker out of there harder to do 
on these cups with a secondary measurement. There's a ridge there and it's harder to get the spatula in and around. Obviously, legibility is very important. Number one, you want them to be transparent so you can see the water level. So the advantage there went to the glass and plastic models because the silicone ones are a little opaque. You mm -hmm. can't really see it quite as quickly and easily. Also, you wanna make sure that the graphics are easy to read. There are a lot of different kinds of graphics. There's some thin lines, some bolder lines, some shorter, <laughs> some longer. What was most important to the testers that they not get all jammed together because they can be hard to read, like that one. Oh. Some of those lines. And that's a tough color. Yeah, not, not easy. The second thing that was important is that they line up really clearly to measurement numbers. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, one of these cups, this guy right there, some of the lines did not have <laughs> corresponding measurement numbers. Yes, the number on this line. Yeah, <laughs> that would take a little deciphering if you were actually using it. Yeah, who's designing those things? <laughs> I just don't get it. Testers also assessed how well these cleaned up, and they did that by filling them with turmeric spiked marinara sauce Ooh. that was warm, letting them sit for three hours, then running them through the dishwasher, and inspecting them for, you know, the smell, the look of the marinara sauce. And there were a couple of plastic and silicone models that actually had traces of that marinara. Mm. They also washed them another 24 times, and to check into the durability and how solid the markings were on the material, they used an all-purpose kitchen sponge to wash them out by hand, but they used that slightly abrasive side. Yep. And one of these cups, believe it or not, the markings oh. got washed right off. That is a total bummer. Not very durable there. <laughs> yeah. So in the end, there were actually two recommendations. This is the Pyrex one cup measuring cup. It's about $10. This is a fantastic basic measuring cup. It was accurate. It's legible and easy to read. It's easy to work from. It's got a nice wide opening. It's microwavable. It's sturdy. This is a terrific measuring cup. If you have those days where you don't want to bend over and you like the dual measurement cups, the one that the testers preferred was this one. This is the OXO Good Grips One Cup Angled Measuring Cup. It's about $7. It was easy to use, easy to see, and both sets of measurements were <laughs> accurate. Good information, Adam. Thank you. My pleasure. So we have not one, but two winners. The first is made of glass. It's by Pyrex. It's the One Cup Measuring Cup. It's about $10. The second is made of plastic, and you can view it from above. It's by OXO Good Grips, and it's the One Cup Angled Measuring Cup, and it's about $7. New potatoes are called new potatoes because they're picked from the vine at the start of the growing season, often when the leaves on the vines are still nice and green. Now, the skin on the outside of the potatoes is very thin, but it can be red, yellow, or white. And the interior flesh is firm and a little bit waxy. We love to simply boil them, but Lawman's here. He's going to show us a new way to jazz up those potatoes. The secret to easy, flavorful potatoes? It's simple. You got to crush them. Crush them. All right. Here I have two pounds of small red potatoes that I'm going to add to this eight quart Dutch oven. Now you could use small yellow potatoes, but to be honest, I like the look of the red potatoes better in this dish. Gotcha. We're going for red. All right. And I'm going to add two tablespoons of salt. I'm going to cover the potatoes with one inch of cold water because we want the potatoes to cook evenly. And then we're going to bring it up to a boil over high heat. The potatoes are boiling nicely. We want to reduce the heat to medium high. And this is important so that the potatoes don't blow out. We want to be able to crush the potatoes later. If they blow out now, it takes away all the fun. <laughs> okay, well, good. So they're gonna simmer for about 20 minutes. All right. Bridget, it's been about 20 minutes. Now it's time to check the potatoes for doneness. Okay. The best way is to take a paring knife and you wanna slip it into the potato easily with no resistance. There's no resistance. I like to check a couple of the potatoes just in case they moved around. Yes. And you get that one potato that's done and the other ones are still like rocks. Oh yeah. And now I'm gonna drain the potatoes. Now I'm gonna dry the pot out because we don't want any liquid when we make our butter sauce. While the potatoes are resting over here, we're gonna start prepping our butter sauce. First things first, we're gonna chop our aromatics. All right. Now, Bridget, at my house, 10 fingers is overrated, <laughs> but doesn't mean that you shouldn't take care of chopping your herbs. First, we need two <laughs> tablespoons of minced chives. So I'm gonna use a claw method, keeping my fingers away from the blade. The edge of the blade is right on my knuckles. Mm, and it smells good. Next, we're gonna chop our parsley. I'm gonna do it a little differently. I'm gonna start with the knife in the middle. My left hand's gonna be right on the back. And it's gonna keep the blade from jumping around. 
I'm mincing this parsley. I'm looking for two tablespoons. Now that I've showed off my knife skills a little bit, <laughs> for garlic, I like to use this garlic press. You and Julia both love that garlic press. <laughs> it's just one clove of garlic. Okay. Now we have six tablespoons of unsalted butter that I'm gonna melt over medium heat. Okay. Bridget, the butter is just about melted. Now I'm gonna add one garlic clove. You wanna add the garlic clove and cook until fragrant, about 30 seconds. The garlic is nice and fragrant and toasty. I'm gonna turn the heat off so we can add our, our herbs. First, I'm gonna add two tablespoons of minced parsley and then the two tablespoons of fresh chives. Mm. Along with half a teaspoon salt and a quarter teaspoon of pepper, thank you. You bet. Oh, even off heat, you can smell the chives blooming in that. Give this a nice stir. Mm. And now we can add our potatoes. So right now I'm just gonna stir the potatoes, make sure they're covered in that nice herb butter sauce. Now we're gonna pop the potatoes, we're gonna crush the potatoes. It's similar to bubble wrap, strangely satisfying. I'm gonna take the back of the spoon and just press it up against the potato until you hear like a little bit of a pop sound. Think of it as you're opening the potato's mouth so it can take in all that herby, buttery goodness. Oh, I like that. Now that I've opened them all up, I'm gonna give them a stir so that that butter can get all around them inside. Now the moment you've been waiting for, it's time to eat. Oh, thank goodness. You're being very polite. I was about ready to dive into that Dutch oven. <laughs> beautiful. Oh, yes. They look beautiful. Thank you. The crushed, not really smashed, not mashed. Potatoes are hard. They're difficult to cook well. But when you get a recipe that allows all this flavor inside the potato, and the potato itself is beautiful. It's creamy, really well seasoned. Buttery, herby, little garlic. Mm. All that butter juice has been sopped up by the potato. And you think that this is good? There are some more versions on our website. There's smoked paprika and capers and oregano. Creamy inside, buttery outside, herbs, garlic. One might say that you crushed it. I think I did. I think you did too. Believe you me, you're gonna wanna make these potatoes at home and they start by simmering red potatoes until they're tender. Cook garlic and butter, then add chives and parsley. Then pour in the potatoes. Use a spoon to crush each potato and toss to coat in the garlic butter. So from Cook's Country, fast and foolproof crushed red potatoes. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season along with tastings, testings, and select episodes on our website. That's cookscountry.com slash TV. Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>